So today we're talking to one of the most distinguished biochemists in Oxford University. Um, he has a membership of fellowships of not only chemistry and biochemistry societies, but also physics and biology. So Tony Watts is, in addition to being a distinguished biochemist, he's also the vice principal of one of the colleges of Oxford University, St. Hughes College. So, Tony, what we're interested in here is your science, mm -hmm. and my understanding is that you work at the very interface that enables us to see, feel, hear, touch, whatever, correct? My interest for many years has been the membrane, the outer membrane of cells, and this is the first line of attack, for example, for a foreign body to a cell, such as a bacterium. It's also the first point of contact for drugs, for example. Yeah. Hormones within the body, that's the first point at which such molecules interact. But it also is the way we respond to the environment. As you mentioned, light yes. Um, yes. Uh, for senses for us, but also for bacteria. They sense light and use light to drive energy sources. Also, uh, it's, it's the first line for environmental changes, for changes in acidity or uh, alkalinity, or as a way of driving an organism towards food uh, and, and to be able to pick up food products uh, and, and use that as nutrients. So the plasma membrane has a host of functions about which we still know really very little. So it, it, it is the target that we go for. Indeed. and And so... If you look at a, a single cell, for example, mm. for a moment, you could say that's its nervous system. It is the place where almost all of the signals to the inside of yes. the cell have to pass. And it, it's a very interesting uh, entity. It's made of lipids. And lipids, interestingly, are not um, encoded for yeah, exactly. from the genome. They, they're right? just they're inherited without being encoded. That's right. So this is a, has an interesting that's property. Interesting the way in which lipids themselves self-assemble is a very interesting area of thermodynamics and physical chemists have been studying these for years. I started in that area for my, my PhD, for example. But they have far more far-reaching uh, implications in the food industry. Much of our food is emulsified through lipids. Drug delivery, for example, absolutely. And also to deliver drugs in a lipidic environment. For example, chemotherapy drugs are often delivered with a lipid environment. And then for diet, of course, they're almost lipids, some of them, and we all know about omega-3s and so on, and the importance of those to fetal development, uh, and memory development as well, and memory function. So this is well publicized and all well, well demonstrated. Why well, we should be eating a lot of fish. Absolutely, yes. These oily fishes are, 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 are vital uh, to, for our makeup. You focus right down on the structure mm. of the molecules at that surface membrane and as I understand it, you not only determine the structure of those but you're able to actually take some of those that are light sensitive mm. and actually put them onto yes. a, a, a solid state device. Yes, yes. Tell us more about that. So, so one of the areas of research in, in my group is to take photoreceptors. Now these are very similar to the proteins these at the, the back of your eye yes. and the archaeal original of that, the evolutionary forebear of that. Yes. These yes. are from extreme bacteria that live under extreme conditions. They sense light under particular conditions and convert it into energy, a solar cell, yes. and they use that to drive the cell. So they're very stable. Yes. What we've managed to do is to take those out of these bacteria and put them on to a gold surface to make them electrically conducting. And then show that there's switching capability with light. Now, the two important things about that is that, firstly, in biology, we select light and color specifically. And we know cats can see in the dark, and we know that spiders can see in the ultraviolet. Most man-made devices don't have that selectivity. So this is quite an interesting phenomenon to exploit from bottom up, the way evolution has captured the quantum biology for this effect, yes. and then put it into an application device. Yes. And, and that is quite a nice, exciting project that, yes. that is going on in the lab, yes. Just for a general audience, quantum biological effect, what you mean there is that it's so exquisitely sensitive that a single light 
-hmm. photon can actually excite yes. the uh, molecule. Yes. Correct? That's right. So it's quantum capture, yeah. a single photon of light at an efficiency that man has not yet ever been able to achieve. Yeah in time scales that are a fifteenth of a second for the initial response. Yeah. And again, man has not been able to, yes. from a top-down point of view, to be able to replicate that. So I think there's huge potential in learning the quantum effects that have evolved in biology, and we still do not understand those, into these kind of applications. Yeah. But it's the basic science which you need first before you get to the application. Now I want to take you back to the, the, the issue of the bacteria, mm -hmm. uh, Tony, because another area which I think is of very great mm -hmm. public interest is the challenge that we're facing from bacteria sure. now. I mean, it's clear that we're running out of antibiotics of the classical kind. What can we do about that? Can you solve that problem? <laughs> So, solve is not the word, but yeah. add to the knowledge base, certainly yes. one would hope to be able to do that. Yeah. Um, and as I said before, the membrane is the first point of attack. And that also, for a bacterium, would be the first point of attack for an antibiotic. Now, Oxford, of course, as you know, with Heatley and Florey here developing penicillin, and indeed at St. Hughes College, where I'm vice yes. principal, was one of the places where the first human trials were ta taking place on military personnel. This was during the war? During the war, the gardens were turned over to a military hospital, yes. Yes. and, and uh, patients were brought in, and these uh, penicillin was, was uh, tried out and indeed recovered in bedpans, which is an interesting story. But penicillin um, has not had its day, but penicillin certainly is generating resistance in bacteria. So are many of the other, the vancomycin, for example, uh, and, and many other uh, antibiotics which are traditionally used. And we now, I think, only have two patented antibiotics. And the last time a new antibiotic was introduced was 2004. So we have a real issue here. And not just the cost to the health industry, of course, but patients and deaths. Can nature help with that? So th th this is interesting. We've been looking recently at some peptide-derived antibiotics. So these are made up of amino acids, the same kind of building blocks as for proteins. And here we have a lot of variability. But by understanding the heptad repeat of these, a turn every seven residues, an unstructured peptide in solution, when it attacks or it uh, lands on a bacterial membrane can form a structure which perturbs the bacterium and then punches a hole in it which is what you want to do and the bacterium lyses and is killed. Yes. So here then you're not as it were designing an exact key to a particular lock you're actually allowing the flexibility of a molecule to mold itself to do what you That's want right, to do. That's right, yes. That's fantastic. Yeah, so there are different mechanisms that have been suggested for yes. how these kinds of molecules work. Yeah. And we just picked up another subtle variation where we think we can get more selective action on bacterial yes. cells and at the same time, importantly, not kill uh, human cells, of course, yes. your, your host or the red blood cells, yes. which is the way we've, we've looked at that. So that's been an interesting recent foray. But it's, when you say structure, I get a little nervous because structure implies something that's rigid. Indeed, which it is not. Biology is not. If it doesn't move, it doesn't do anything. And you have to have dynamics, you have to have interaction, you have interaction over many time scales, and you need specialist biophysical and physical techniques to pull that detail out. And it, it, we needed a sophisticated battery of biological methods from imaging through to spectroscopy and then computational modeling to try and fit all the data together. So that has been an interesting chapter and two PhDs have been working on that recently. In fact, supported by the National Physical Laboratories, quite interestingly. Well, we have to wish you luck in the search for new antibiotics, otherwise we're, we're all dead in the long run, aren't we? Um, now, I want to take you into another area which I think your work seems to me to be exciting from a public interest point of view, which is, I think, best put like this. If we imagine a molecule being this sort of size for a moment, then the cell membrane is somewhere up in Aberdeen, isn't it? So, you know, it's a huge distance to go. Now, 
Um, I think you've also been interested in how on earth it can be that something way back up there in Aberdeen is affecting something down here in the nucleus. Yes, so I always try and teach this in tutorials to students, that feeling of distance and yeah. magnitude within the cell, because it, it's often forgotten. But you're absolutely right. If you scale, you're on the right scale. So one of the things that, that we have again been trying to understand is how at the membrane surface, where the three-dimensional diffusion in many areas is restricted to two dimensions, Indeed. that means collision is much higher, a much Indeed, greater yeah. higher. It's like a bee flying Indeed. against a pane of glass. Precisely so, so, yes. yes. So uh, we've looked at um, some neuroreceptors. In fact, the largest family of proteins in us. It's one percent of our genome. And these are called G-protein coupled receptors. They're receptors and they're very important for um, uh, not only for hormone regulation but also uh, they, they, in disease states things can happen. You know well about the estrogen receptor as a marker for certain types of breast cancer. The one we work on is a marker for colon cancer for example. But it signals three different pathways from one ligand which is moving around on this one particular receptor, but it's the dynamics of that ligand and how it gets to its site and where it moves within the protein, the receptor, that signals uh, sig uh, to, the cent to the cell and downstream processing. We have no idea which one it selects, but clearly in one of them, it signals to the nucleus yes. things go wrong. And saying, in effect, you know, give me more proteins of this kind. Yes, that's so right. Roughly speaking. Yeah. So one thing we've done recently, which hadn't been done before, is look at the single molecule interactions, which you normally would get in a cell, right the way up to high levels of expression induced by the nuclear interactions, of course, yeah. and that is a disease and pathogenic state. So here we have a concentration dependence to understand normality and disease, which may well be quite an interesting uh, new insight into these G protein couples. Uh, and how you can produce better markers for disease states like cancer. Oh, ab absolutely. We know, need those too. And frustratingly, we don't yet have any drugs for our particular right. receptor. But 40 or 50 percent of all drugs act on these G on protein G coupled receptors. Exactly so, yes. you know, we know about asthma treatment with salbutamol and drugs for one receptor in the lung. But with 2,000 out there, and maybe 850, which could be drug targets, and the others are olfactory receptors, there's huge potential. So that's why the drug companies are interested in people trained in this area, possibly out of my lab, of course. So to uh, somehow summarize this situation, mm -hmm. Tony, you're working at the very interface, that's a good word here, isn't it? Both interface to the point of view of how we as organisms know about the outside world and how cells know about the outside world, all of those things happening on the surface membrane. Yes. Um, you're working on how we might get new antibiotics. You're working with solid state devices to build new ways in which you can use biological molecules to produce well, they would be imaging mechanisms, yes. wouldn't they? Yes. Well, used in uh, very special cameras, for example, um, that would take you down to a resolution which would be absolutely fantastic because this would be at least as good as the eye itself. That's right. That's right. Yes. So, no surprise, therefore, that you've won a huge number of prizes, <laughs> including recently yes. uh, a major international thank prize. You, yes. So, many congratulations and thank you very much for talking to us uh, about some absolutely fascinating biochemical work. But it isn't just biochemical, is it, you see? You're a, you're a physicist, mm -hmm. <laughs> you're a mathematician, you're a chemist. Mm -hmm. yes. it, it's fantastic. Yes. Thank you very much, Danny. Thanks very much, Dennis. It's been a yeah. pleasure.